so based on your experience of working on industrial policy in east asia south asia and africa what do you think is most important for bangladesh uh, for upgrading <coughs> Thank you, Abir, and thank you, uh, Youth Policy Forum, for organizing this extremely important event. I am so glad finally someone has done it, because this kind of forum was really missing in Bangladesh to flash out ideas. And we will not agree about everything, but it's very important to have different perspectives come together so that Bangladeshis can hear alternative views and decide for themselves what will work. There is a lot I agree in what Arsene has said. I think a lot of his stuff is very close to, to mine. But there are also areas where I have a slightly different take, so I will also outline them in a very friendly and constructive way. I think that where I agree with him is that it is really dangerous to look at China or South Korea or some other countries and say, can we repeat that kind of state um, exercise because every state, every society is based on a distribution of power. It's based on a distribution of power and capabilities. And the distribution of power and capabilities in a China or a South Korea or a Malaysia is very different from the distribution of power and capabilities in Bangladesh. This is the first point. So here I completely agree with you. What is the role of the state? And I think that Akhtar Mahmoud started off by saying it's really important for the state to coordinate. I think it's beyond coordination. It's also lots of other things. And I think that one of the things that really is the critical binding constraint for countries to become richer and more productive is we have to learn about how to organize production. It's what I call organizational capabilities. Organizational capabilities are not simple things to The reason why countries don't move up the value chain is not because they can't buy the machines. Machines are, you can buy the machines anywhere. It's not because they don't have the skilled workers. You can skill people quite quickly. What is very difficult is knowing how to put the workers and the machines together in a global supply chain and achieve the competitiveness that you require to sell in global markets. With the same machines and the same skilled workers, the productivity of one firm might be 10 times higher than the productivity of another firm. It's unbelievable. When you look at the statistics, the difference in productivity between a well-organized firm and a badly organized firm with the same machines and the same skills can be 10 to 1 or higher. Business people will know what I'm talking about. Right? Economists often don't understand it. Economists think that production is putting capital and labor together. If I have a good machine and I have a good worker, I will have a good output. This is not the case. You have to know how to organize production and the, through the whole supply chain and manage quality, manage on-time performance, manage inventories, manage all kinds of things which are not in the textbook. This is only learned by doing. It's a learning by doing process. And this is why countries rise up or do not rise up. The role of the state is to help this process. How they do it is different. Now, there are two challenges here. And I think 
this is at the heart of my, my work. First is that the private sector will not be able to do all this learning by doing without some help. It needs assistance. And this is the story of rents. Some form of assistance, whether it is through cheap credit, access to land, access to industrial zones, some forms of protection, some forms of subsidy, different countries have done different things. So the first thing you require is the state has to support that learning process. But then there is a second problem. Left to themselves, the private sector will use this rent for any purpose it wants, and it may not be to raise productivity. So the real problem is, you can give the loan, how do you discipline the loan? How do you make it, make sure that the private sector converts this subsidy into a productive outcome? It's at the disciplining phase that most industrial policy fails. Okay, it's not just coordination, it's also coordination plus discipline. <coughs> if you want to understand why China is different and South Korea is different, they use discipline in different ways to make sure that the massive support that industry was getting was disciplined and the industry that did not perform not only lost the subsidy, it lost the business in many cases. In South Korea, the businesses that were getting the subsidies, if they did not perform in terms of export growth, not only was the subsidy and the loan taken back, the entire company was taken back and given to somebody else. Now, if you compare that with most other countries, including ours, but not just ours, if you compare it with India, with Africa, forget about the company, even getting the loan back is impossible. So what happens here is that the big players get large loans, and then they take more loans to service that loan, and more loans to service that loan, and very few of them raise productivity enough to become competitive. The incredible thing is that some of them do. So some of these players do become competitive, but a lot of them don't become competitive. And the real failure of the state is the failure to discipline. Now, when people say we have to learn from South Korea and China, I completely agree with Stefan. We cannot learn how they did the disciplining because the distribution of power and capabilities in Bangladesh and the distribution of organizational strength in Bangladesh is different. So our state cannot discipline like they did in South Korea or China. So what do we do? Here is where the conversation becomes really interesting because the disciplining in our kinds of contexts has to be a different strategy. We have to rely on a mix of markets, but also innovative forms of support that becomes very difficult to capture. The form of the support cannot simply be a loan, cannot simply be a subsidy, because this will be captured. But you can give the support in a different way that becomes very difficult to capture, and then market competition raises your productivity and you become competitive. You might ask, this sounds really complicated. How does that happen? <laughs> well, it happened in the garments industry. How did the garments industry emerge? Everybody in the world, all LDCs in the late 70s under the MFA put export quota free to the US. But only one or two countries became competitive. Bangladesh was one of them. What was different about Bangladesh? What was different about Bangladesh was the way in which this benefit created incentives for learning that could not be captured. So if you remember that history, the MFA created quota rents. The quota rent came to Bangladesh if it could export to the US, but it could only export to the US if it produced a shirt of the quality and price that someone would buy in Walmart. But Bangladesh did not know how to make the shirt. It could buy the machine, it had the workers of the right skills, but it did not know how to make a, a shirt of that price and quality. Here comes the FBI, but not in the standard way of FBI. It was a partnership between Desh and Daewoo, where people from Desh went to Daewoo, 
in Busan and then learned how to organize the factory. In reality, the organization that what I was talking about earlier, the organization of capability, they learned on site how to set up the inventory, how to set up the quality control, how to do just in time production, how to link up in the value chain. Then when they came back, they could use the machines and the workers, and the growth rate was 100 percent a year. Now, see the interesting thing here. If the government had given they would as our Desh a subsidy and said go and learn, Desh might never have learned. But the government did not give Desh a subsidy. The government gave Desh an opportunity to become competitive and it would only be able to capture the rent after it had achieved the knowledge of how to produce. Although we will talk later on about the Indian example of automobiles, which is exactly the same story. The Indian automobile story is also a story of you get the prize after you have become competitive, not before. In our sorts of states, if you give the prize before you become competitive, it's very unlikely that you become competitive. Right? So you have to design financing, and this is where we need to talk to our friends in the private sector and our friends in the international uh, markets. How to link up these supply chains where our firms will learn how to organize production and get a price, but only after they have made the effort of raising productivity, not before. If you give the price before, it will be wasted. Or very likely to be wasted. So I think this is one of the things that I would stress about this conversation. The last thing I would say before ending, and just need to be provocative. This question is, how do these elite parties change? You know, so I think uh, Stefan uh, posed a, a really good question that we need to have a new kind of developmental party, and I agree with him. Where I slightly disagree with Stefan is that I don't see how you can change the elite party by taking the elites into a room and having a conversation. That is not how the elite parties change. Elite parties don't change by elites sitting and agreeing about how to share the rents. They don't do that in Bangladesh. They don't do that in the US. They don't do that in the UK. Elites are competitive. <coughs> they will compete with each other. They will fight each other, sometimes quite violently. And the history of Bangladesh is one of very quite violent elite conflicts. So I think that posing that as what you need to do might be a block, right? Because I don't think, I can't see it. Our elites sitting together and agreeing about how to split the rents or how to agree about the development of that. I don't think that will happen, but I don't think that will happen in India. I don't think that will happen in Pakistan. And it doesn't happen in the US. That's not how it happens. How does it happen? So the way it happens is exactly like it happened with the garments industry. We have to find opportunities where there is a particular minister or a particular businessman and a particular foreign investor. And they come with an agreement, not at the national level, but at a very sectoral level, very small level, which does not threaten other powerful people. The main thing about elites is that you should not threaten all the powerful people at the same time, because they will then block you. What The reason why the garments industry succeeded is because nobody was interested in this cheap labor activity. The fact that it would become 80% of Bangladesh's export earning, no one knew. Had they known it, they would all have jumped into it and they would have blocked it. So we have to find things which are so uninteresting right now that like I'm going to make some auto component parts, no one is interested. Right? People are interested in big infrastructure, they are interested in building roads, they are not interested in these small things. So we have to find something that the big players are not interested in because the big regs are not there. We have to find something that has growth potential. We have to find something where there's a lot of learning about productivity growth, link up the foreign technology provider, innovative financing instruments that cannot be captured, and that's where the conversation is. That's the conversation we need to have. Because and that will change your elite bargain, but it will change the elite bargain from below. Yes. It, you cannot change the elite bargain from above. I this is the main point of difference. If that if is okay, but, but you might not have a big difference at all. Thank you. Right. I'm, I'm, I think uh, it's, 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 it's there's a risk here that too much agreement will break out here in this room, so we can't have that. Um, but I, I want to comment on, on a few points, because 
and, and somehow to reinforce actually what Mushtaq says. When I say <coughs> we've learned a lot about FDI, actually this is what I'm referring to. In fact, most of the economics research, the ones that at least read economics research, will, will, will know, and rather than just state, state, state things as sometimes happens on, 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 uh, on, on, on some of these issues, you know, there's a lot of FDI that has very few benefits to countries. There is actually FDI that we have good evidence on that actually really seems to begin to work. And we have some good evidence on Eastern Europe, for example, of how it was used. <coughs> and it actually is in that spirit, you know, because even before you started talking, I said, oh, I have a disagreement with it. And I wrote down managerial capabilities, which you call organizational capabilities, is that actually the one thing we've learned is that what the real thing that, that, that FDI brings is managerial capabilities. Now, we could disagree in terms of how we then do this in the role of the state in that learning, but it is the fundamental part, you know, what, and it's actually even thinking back, and I'm not going to try to tell you your own history of, of Walton, but what I understood from going to visit there, there is another way in which things are, are being learned. There is, there is managerial capabilities, there's also understanding of markets, and that actually a lot of businesses emerge from initially being importers. They actually say, well, why can't I do that myself? They understand the market. So exporters often emerge because they actually have noticed, my God, is that what I get if I buy it from Vietnam? And actually say, I could do that as well. And so begin to do it. So you have knowledge of markets and knowledge of managerial capabilities. And these two things, you know, it's extremely hard to learn when you close off from the rest of the world. Because then there is no opportunity to learn. And, and if I may be very frank in saying, I think that's a big problem in the Pakistan economy, where actually very little of that is taking place. Where actually here you have an example with RNG that, as you correctly explained, of how it worked. Now, so, and so it does mean some of the future will come from finding ways of tradable production, um, I do think FDI plays a role, but we agree, and actually we, prob we probably agree quite a lot in terms of why and how we have to learn to handle this and why we should not be too, too negative about it. There's probably one thing is that we shouldn't forget the risks in this whole thing of incumbency. And that's a very hard one sometimes for the state. I think that's another learning part, and maybe you alluded to it about the rent control, because one of the things is that I would always say is that and, and, and I agree with the way you would design these incentives, but you also want to design it that they actually still fit for purpose for the next firm. That is not for the first firm only. And I think one of the risks is that we often see packages being designed that are great for the first firm, but there's no way we could ever give it to the second firm. You know, and I, I, I would say success for the industrial policy relative to Walton is the emergence of a second Walton. That would be the way the state would, 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 would want to assess this. Of course, that's not your point. That's not your issue. You don't need to do that. But, but I would say that's how you should think about it. It's not about being proud of Walton. It's proud that there's a second Walton emerging uh, would actually be a sign of, of elements of success. So competition matters and encompassy matters. But otherwise, and I like the idea of how to change the lead bargains. I don't want to give the impression that we're going to flesh this out. You know, one of, the, one of the really sad things of some other countries where they start getting the impression that's how you do this. You know, in South Africa, you get endless compacts that don't lead to anything. Because that's sitting in a room where you make supposedly these deals, but actually fundamentally you don't shift it. And it's funny, you know, in the book I talk a lot about, the way you do it is trying to shift somehow the incentives in the system in favor of slightly better, better elite bargains and, and against the status quo. Mm. And in a way, that's what you're alluding to. Uh, because places where there's a lot of incumbency, you can't quite do it. So you want to have the new emergent. In fact, Mushtaq and myself are both also at a conference that focuses, for example, on the digital side. I like that a lot because that actually is something where there's not that much incumbency. And actually, there's a scope to actually renew. So actually, there's not that much. So don't think, and I would also say to you, policy framework, you have to work in a much more subversive way rather than thinking, putting the people in the, t in the same room. It is actually finding ways of actually teasing and shifting, I would say, the incentives and, and the kind of things and on the policy side, rather than thinking we're going to flesh this out, because then I don't think much, it, it will lack the credibility to actually achieve this. So I'll stop there with Paul. Thank you. So, 
this is fascinating. Um, <laughs> we recently had um, an event forging our future where Dr. Moshi Rahman was in conversation with Tim Besley and Shanta Devarajan. And my team uh, was telling me, can we do this physically uh, in Bangladesh? Uh, like, you know, then we can meet the speakers. Welcome to YPF. Uh, we have brought it uh, to Dhaka. Um, I, Sir was mentioning something very important about building coalitions and working in more subversive way. Uh, we also have two more politicians joining us. Uh, Mr. Tabi Tawal was the mayoral candidate from uh, BNP, and uh, Mr. Shamim Hedar Patwari, member of parliament from Gaivanta One. Uh, he's, uh, they're both from the opposition. So you know now we have an opposition heavy, uh, uh, opposition heavy roundtable. Yes, I've introduced him before. So uh, I'm also getting a lot of text messages from my team and others in the panel that can we ask questions? So this is how we are going to go about it. We'll take initial set of remarks. We'll break for snacks and tea. We'll come back and then we'll open the floor. You will ask questions. The panelists will ask you questions and then like, you know, it will be very interactive so that we can challenge each other and push our boundaries.